I'm getting a thumbs up. Hello, good evening, and welcome to a, another Pink and First. This is our Pink and Live end of season debates here at Archon Towers in central Norwich. We've got a host of fired up fans with questions on what went wrong for Norwich City over the last season, and of course, what can well happen next. And to answer their questions, a very distinguished panel of Norwich City Hall of Famer, Darren Eady, Eastern Daily Press columnist, Melissa Rudd, and group football editor, uh, at Archant Paddy Davitt. And we want you guys out there on Facebook to get involved too. If you have an opinion or a question, just post them as a comment on the live feed. And we have producer Jake surveying the area and he will flag up uh, your questions so that the panel can answer those. But uh, I think that is all the admin done. Let's get down to business. And we're gonna start with the past and then we will get stuck into the future, of course. I will go first, uh, guys. How did City season really go, and should they have finished in the top six, Darren? Um, I think you, you you tend to always finish in a season where you deserve to. Um, I don't think there's any surprises that Norwich finished where they did, um, seeing their home form and particularly their away form. So, you know, you, you get what you get after a season. Um, after after that many league games, uh, your position kind of tells where you've been. And uh, if it's just on home games, they they would have been promoted, but. Of course, the away form was, was pretty dreadful. I don't think they'd have been relegated if it had been on away form. Exactly. So it's just um, a, a real contrast in season. I think look, look, nobody really expected. Um, I think expectations from probably everybody at the start of the season was automatic promotion. It was still in mind. And it was even still, even at around Christmas time, I still felt the squad was there to, to do that. Um, changes weren't made. Um, and I think that was probably the biggest factor in us uh, not at least pushing into the playoffs and, and, and into that top two. So... Um, time's been missed a little bit, I think, but uh, there's plenty to look forward to. Evening, Melissa. What do you reckon? Evening, yeah. Um, I think I wouldn't say I'm, I'm pessimistic, but I did think <laughs> before the season. <laughs> um, I thought when we didn't buy a defender in the, in the summer transfer window, um, I think I tweeted then I couldn't really see better than a top 10 finish. Um, just because defence was a problem last season, um, and you know we did we did little to improve that, so I don't think it's any surprise. Quite, I mean, it's surprising quite how bad we've been. But I always thought that would be that would be where we where we fell down, and it's it's kind of it's it's been that way. We've not been good enough at the back. We've not been good enough defending from the front either. And you know that's been that's been our downfall. How do you see it, Pad? With, it, with the massive question of potential. You know what, Michael. I'm sort of minded to go back to that sunny day at Ewood Park when me and you were sat there after the final whistle and thought, wow, this is going to be a good ride. <laughs> oh, um, God. <laughs> unfortunately, it didn't quite pan out like that, did it? But I actually thought of that before a ball was kicked. I thought maybe sixth, uh, or top six at least. I thought top two might be better uh, above them um, because obviously you're coming down, you look at Villa, didn't turn out for them as we might have expected. But certainly Newcastle, I thought they'd be very strong. And as I say, you saw that... Sh super show against Blackburn. You thought, wow, here we go. We're, we're in for a great ride. But um, as the guys have said, I mean, it unraveled that sort of prolonged period prior to Christmas. Couldn't buy a win, leaking goals, not looking like a team. Those fairly incendiary post-match interviews with Russell Martin at Brighton and a little bit later, obviously, Cameron Jerome at Sheffield Wednesday. Clearly, things weren't right. And now we've seen, I mean, hindsight's a wonderful gift. We're looking back on it now. Things weren't right. Um, Russell Mines came out as, as recently as last week and said there was players in that dressing room who really weren't playing for Alex Neal. Um, the board stuck with him during that rocky period prior to Christmas. I think we'd all agree here, probably uh, far too long, uh, far too much loyalty shown. And, and ultimately, that's why they're, they're eighth in the table and now looking at the other clubs going into the playoffs because they were just... Really, it just listed on too long, didn't it? You know, it needed decisive action and a lot sooner. And, and obviously now we've got to deal with consequences going into this summer. I think the problem was we all knew the problems in defence. We could, we could see it, but I think the club kind of felt... And I, I think they did try and recruit there. The recruitment was poor. We know that. They didn't manage to get the deals, any deals over the line. And I still felt, perhaps the club felt, that actually we've got enough in the championship to be OK, which was a, was a big mistake in hindsight. Again, we all look at it, but even looking at that squad they did manage to recruit defensively. I still felt there was enough at the start of the season defensively to be able to get us through. Um, but little did we know what would go on after that. And it was a, a poor show defensively, wrong types of players for the championship. And, and it all kind of, as Paddy said, unraveled pretty quickly just before Christmas. And uh, we thought we were going to go again and strengthen at Christmas time. Again, the recruitment was poor. 
didn't happen, and uh, you find yourselves where you are now, and that's where you're going to be. There's no surprises. I, I guess a lot of that got summed up by Tim Closer, who's a player that everyone was desperate to keep hold of. This guy's going to be fantastic in the championship, and I mean, clearly he's got a load of ability, yet he just isn't built for the championship. And I think he's since said it's the, the toughest division he's ever played in. He's built for <laughs> the championship. He's got a hoot all over the place. He's just looks you like he you be... mentioned his nose last night. Yeah, as but well. he looks like he should be smashing people about. But he doesn't like he doesn't like the the physicality of the game, does he? So much and. Quite frankly, he's, he's, you know, I mean, I think he struggled in the Premier League. Uh, you know, he got caught out so many times with his pace. I remember in particular watching a game against West Ham at home and the ball got, he got caught out in the, the midfield area and he looked like he was towing a bus trying to get back in. Um, so I was really surprised how disappointed he was, to be honest, how disappointed he was. And again, I think that was down to the club probably thinking it'll be all right in the Championship. Yeah, I mean, I, I go back to it. Daryl Murphy absolutely beasted him at Portman Road. And, and Alex Neal, basically, uh, you could see him on the touchline after about 20 minutes. It was literally, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, why, why every big... Because we all knew how Ipswich play under McCarthy. Very agricultural, bashing it forward, bypassing midfield. And he just couldn't cope with the physicality. And, and you thought... Pff. And I think not long after that, we were down at Colney, weren't we? And, and, he, he, and he was... Making mention of that, was it um, Ricky Lambert? He said he'd beaten him up, gave him an, an elbow in the face, and it was almost poor old little me kind of thing, rather than, you know, as Darren says, physically he had everything to be able to mix it with these guys, but culturally, because he's never probably had that in the Bundesliga, at Wolfsburg and, and his other clubs, it was just a culture shock for him, and, and sadly he was, as Darren rightly said, we all hoped he was the go-to man who knitted that defence together, and, and he was struggling, certainly with those physical types of tests that... They, he got more often than not in the championship. He has had a whole season in the championship now, though, Melissa. I mean, it, it, we're going to get onto it, of course, but he's one of those players where do you stick with him and, and see if he can do it next year, or do you move him on and you're already shaking your head down? <laughs> but, Melissa? Um, it's, I mean, it's a tough one. I think, to be honest, the, the injury that he had at the back end of last season, in a way, obviously, we our performances and results declined after that, and he, that was kind of a, oh, well, you know, Close is out injured now. That hasn't helped things. Perhaps that inflated his his kind of worth more than more than it should have done, maybe. Um, and, and going back to that transfer window, I think there was a, a, a feeling among the club and perhaps some fans that if we keep hold of Brady after the, the great European championships he had and closer, then then that's good enough. And, you know, some of us didn't think that way and <laughs> were proved right, ultimately. But, you know, <laughs> it's a tough one. Do you, as you say, do you give him another go? Do you hope that he adjusts? Do, do you hope that a new manager as well will, will kind of instill that kind of confidence and, and see p the parts of his game that he needs to improve? I guess that's for the new, well, Stuart Webber to decide, I guess. It is in indeed, and we'll get into all that uh, as well. I'm interested in you guys. How many here think Norwich had the potential to finish in the top six? No one? Oh, no, let's go. Yeah, hands up, I should have said, probably. <laughs> Start of the season. But not now. So you think that Norwich, what, Norwich, they, the squad wasn't as good as you, as you thought? If anyone wants to say something, flag up to, to Jake. But I mean, I'm interested that the potential from the start of the season, maybe. I think, I think with someone like, with Closer as well, I think he's the type of player, you, you, there's some things you can't teach. You can teach skills, you can get them playing the game the right way and how you want them to play, but you can't teach that mentality. If you've got that or you haven't, you're either someone who does dig in and, and get stuck into people or you're not. And he's just not. So th as Melissa said, do you give him another chance? I think, well, I can't see much changing, to be honest, unless they play a different system where he's going to get a, a, a way of actually playing maybe even a three at the back where he's not. So having to be so physical and he can control things, I think he might improve. But there's just some things you can't teach in football and, and, and that kind of desire and mentality is something you can't. Um, should we move on to a, another... Jake, have you got... Uh, yeah, I'm going to pass uh, the mic over to Ryan Brown. Oh, you mentioned about the, the potential at the start of the season. Um, perhaps there was a, a big decision which didn't happen mid-season. And I think that, Ryan, that was your question. Is that you? I'm just going to pass the mic over to you. Well, I personally looked at the start of the season and obviously with, with the defensive problems we had, um, I personally think we should have probably just ripped it up and started again because... We got caught out so many times in the Premier League. We got caught out so many times this year. I mean, even when Dykes come in after Olsen, I think he's been caught out a couple of times as well. Pinto gets caught out a lot down the right-hand side. Obviously, bombing forward because he's an attacking fullback. But I personally thought at the start of the season, Alex Neil shouldn't have been given the season to have a go at it because he should have cleared out in the summer. I think one of the biggest problems we had, and we'll all, I'm sure we'll all agree on this, was 
too many times I heard coming out of Colney, right from the very start of the season, is we're a Premier League team, we're Premier League players. And that went through right up till Christmas until they realised they were bang in it, before they realised actually probably we're not. And I think we, we probably put a lot of these players up on a pedestal too much. We brought in some decent names that still had a bit to prove. But I think they all thought they were better than they were at the time. And, and quality will get you so much in the Championship. But, you know, I've listened to Steve Bruce and I've listened to Rafa Benitez saying about the type of players you need to play in the Championship. That's the one thing they said when they went in ma into management. And I didn't hear that coming out from Alex Neal because he, he wouldn't have that experience. So... It's something he had to learn as well, but ultimately didn't really change too much. And I, re I remember, even bef in pre-season, Alec Neal talking about entertaining the fans. We're going to entertain the fans this season. And I'm thinking, it's championship, 46 games, just win some games and we'll all be happy. And it was almost cart before horse. What, what we're talking about here, basically, is whether it's individuals or whether it's the mindset. Defensively, they just, they just weren't set up to, to deal with what they were getting going to get in the championship. And I'll tell you what was telling for me was Alan Irvin's last press conference, just last week, in fact, against QPR, where he basically said again, we spent all week working defensively, and, and over the entire 10 games that I've been in charge, we've done more work defensively than the entire season put together, which to me is a, is a sad indictment on what Alex Neal was drilling into these lads day in, day out at Colney. We all know that his philosophy was to, to dominate the possession and... and basically pin teams back through the quality of our creative players. But, but you can't neglect the defensive side of the game, particularly when you go to a Rotherham with no disrespect, even though it is disrespect when you say that. <laughs> um, you know, the Burtons of this world. You have to realise that Tuesday night, Bristol City, you're going to get the ball bashed into your box and you need to have at least prepared for that threat. It was almost, as Darren says, we're Norwich, we're, we've got better players, I'm a better coach, we'll just steamroll you. Sadly, that was proven not to be the case. Um, and to me, that was naive on Alex Neal's part. We have to take it back to the start of the season as, as well, though, Melissa, because, and, and you guys, because I think generally, and it was Ryan, wasn't it? I, I think you felt maybe it was time to rip it up in the summer, but generally, a lot of fans were like, no, he's, this guy's got a lot of potential, he needs to hang around. That was the feeling at, at that point. And I, I guess the key question from then is why, given what Russell Martin had said um, just the other week before the last game of the season, was Alec in post so long? It, it was bizarre to me after the, the comments made after the Brighton game in particular. Anyone who heard those post-match comments, you know, the, they basically said, we're not playing for the manager. And how a manager can, can stay in his job when it's been publicly made clear from the squad of players that, that they're not putting it in for him. Um, I think from that point on, it just kind of it went from there. I think we had Leeds at home the following game after that. Uh, and again, we just made basic errors at the back. We gave it a go. We lost 3-2. Um, but you could see then, you know, it, we may have worked on defensive set pieces all week in training, but it gets to a game and, and they're not doing it again. And the, the, the worst thing as well is the kind of goals we conceded. I mean, so many from set pieces. Just absolute basic. It's schoolboy football. I know that's a cliche, but it is. It's, it's you know, it's not leaving your man on corners. It's, it's making sure you get to the ball first. And... There's times when you've watched Norwich this season, you just think, well, what have you been doing all week? You know, we say it in the stands, but, it, you know, it, it makes you feel like that because you just think that these are basic things that are just not, not being done by professional footballers, many of which were in the, the, the Premier League last season. It's tricky, I suppose, because we saw a lot of wonderful goals being scored and then, you know, the, the reel of goals conceded. <laughs> Probably quite amusing viewing as well. Jake, you were giving me the sign too. I was. Um, we've got loads of comments um, and questions coming through on the Pink and Facebook, so please carry on doing that. Um, just while you're talking about the defensive frailties, Anita, you posed a little question to me earlier, which I've written down here, which I think is kind of the perfect time to bring you in here if you want to ask it to the guys. Um, I just said that we could all see as fans that the defence was the problem, and I just wondered why Alex Neal and the board could not see that this was a problem and didn't, didn't you know, do a bit more in that area in the summer? Well, I think um, David McNally brought Alex Neal in, um, and I think he put a lot of trust in him. And a lot of trust was put in David McNally to run the football club. I think he was basically in control of everything there. So whatever he wanted to do was going to be done. He brought in Alex Neal, um, and Alex Neal had an arrogance about him, which when you're on the way up is fine because you can get away with it. But when you're on your way down... Um, sometimes that arrogance, you need a bit of humility, essentially, and, and then understand what other people are thinking, because we could all see it. You know, I've had the benefit of, of being inside the changing rooms and seeing it, and now from a media and a, and a fan point of view, from seeing it as well. And my, my opinions didn't change from that 10-game poor run that they had. 
that they were doomed for the season. They weren't going to get in the playoffs and they were not going to get up. And there was still a lot of optimism. Oh, Alex Neal's the man for us. We, but even at the start of the season, I just felt it wasn't going to happen um, for those reasons, because he had this arrogance about him. wanted always to play the same way. Um, didn't mix things up much. And, and I just felt there's, there was going to be a problem. And that's, that's the benefit of why I see in the change room. I, can, I, I saw the signs. I saw the signs that the players were saying after games, even though they were saying, we're all in this together. I could, I could just tell you. I could tell you what they're thinking in those changing rooms. And, and as Paddy said, they're in the changing rooms and some of them weren't playing for him. I could have told you that probably three or four games into the poor run they had. Because um, I, I know in the position I'd have been in if I was in those changing rooms, you can see it. Um, so it was, it was disappointing because nobody, it felt like nobody was listening, but a lot of trust was put in David McNally and put into Alex Neal because, like we all did, we wanted them to succeed. Of course we did. But sometimes, you know, you've got to just change things. Um, and we didn't do that. We didn't do it quick enough and do it early enough. I think the interesting, I remember asking Alec this at, at some point over the course of the season, quite early on in the season, that um, Alan Irvin, I think the, the way I phrased the question to him was, oh, you brought Alan Irvin in to help um, you improve defensively. And he went, have I? Oh, oh, right. As if that, he didn't quite seem to think that that was actually why. And I think we kind of figured, didn't we, Pat, that that, that would be something that Alan would, would bring to the party under Alec? I mean, I think the reality is, uh, and I've seen it firsthand, uh, particularly going away on, on tour in the summer, that Alex Neil was very hands-on. And I'm not sure Alan Irvin would have got too much in the way of leeway to actually implement his own ideas. Because, you, as I say, this 10-game run, and, and speaking to the players, they've all said what an excellent coach he is, and very innovative. And, and I thought he was telling again when Alan Irvin uh, will come on to it about the, the, the new head coach and potentially his role in it. He doesn't want to be Bibs, Bibs Balls and Cones, man. Maybe there was too much of that under Alex Neil because he, it, it was, to take Darren's point, and you can see now with the, the departure, the club have gone down and they just want a head coach to coach players and to win football games. Alex Neal was in control of everything, recruitment-wise, the academy and the playing staff. And, and I think it was just too much of a heavy burden. And we've got to remember as well, a very young man who was basically going through his first turbulent phase as a, as a coach. And it's a, it's a tough grounding to try and come through that when, when ultimately the expectation as a Norwich manager is to get Norwich back up into the Premier League at the first attempt. And I think it was just basically, while they reaped the benefit of his, of, his, of his first six, seven, eight months, I think really we're not just talking about the championship. It was the second half of the Premier League, wasn't it? And that's why, obviously, you know, there's people who maybe felt it was time to make a change in the summer because you could see the decline for me had already set in, you know, going back to last January. Which I think is why it's going to be so interesting to see where he ends up next. I'm really interested when it, when it happens. Jake. Hello. Um, we've got some burning questions from the audience, but we're going to go to some on, on the Facebook Live at the moment. Um, a couple of things that's come up, um, largely around the word leadership. Um, so oh I think dear. the big one there is were there enough leaders on the pitch? This is Stuart Woith and sorry, Keith Shaw, dropped my phone, um, but also mentioning Russell Martin as well. Were there enough leaders on the pitch? And also, is Russell Martin the correct guy to be leading out this team? And then we'll get some more questions from you guys. Which I guess funnels into the captaincy debate, which it feels like we had most of the season, even though I'm not, I'm not entirely sure we needed to. But Darren, do you disagree with that? No, I, I totally agree with, with the comments on Facebook. Um, it's something, again, we pointed out quite early on in the season, that, that, that leader out on the pitch. I think one of the problems we have, because, again, they looked to certain players that come into the football club who were probably going to take that role up, like Naismith, Closer, all these type of players that would, you would think would step up to the mark and be that leader. I think the problem was, because... Closer was playing so poorly. Naismith wasn't setting anything like when he first came here. It's very difficult to be a leader when you first come into a football club and, and you, you kind of lead by example in, in your performances, first of all. Then you can start digging out rollickings to everybody else in the team. You can't really do that if you're coming in and you're not playing yourself or you've been left out by the manager. And again, that was another thing for me that Alex Neal got wrong, essentially, was somebody had a bad game. He dropped him for two or three games. And sometimes you've got to stick by your players because that will make enemies straight away. Um, but... So again, you couldn't then get into, you know, Naismith, if he had a poor game, he was out of the side for three or four games. He couldn't then fulfill that role of being a leader on the pitch because they said, well, you haven't even played the last two or three. Why are you dishing blockings out to me? Excuse my language on Facebook. That's all right. <laughs> but, but it, sorry on Darren's behalf. Yeah, we're but, all sorry. But that, that's kind of how it is. And you look for those people to lead. But if they're not playing regular first team football, then they kind of left us with all the nice players on the pitch that didn't really have that about them. But you could be the best leader in the world, surely, if, you know, five of the other guys aren't that fussed. What can you do about it? Well, I, I mean... Sorry, Melissa, that was sorry, a bit... This is a tough question. Um, the Russell Martin debate, I'm sure we'll get onto that later as well, but it is a tough one because especially 
working in the media as well, you see how genuine he is uh, in post-match interviews as well, uh, what a genuinely nice guy he is. And, you know, it, it, it does... I'm sure if he, was, um, if he was the complete opposite off the field and if he was a nightmare to interview, it's easier to kind of... That, that criticism that, that gets fired at him is perhaps you become less defensive of it. But, you know, there is no question that on the pitch... I don't, I don't think he is. I don't think he is a captain. I mean, and, and that that doesn't. That's not just this season. Um, that's going back to, to. I think I remember a game, um, Charlton. Uh, we were two 0 up at the Valley, um, two 0 up and, and cruising. To be honest, and, and Charlton got it back to two two. And it was you could see the absolute panic that set on on the pitch. And it took Alex Neal to beckon Russell Martin over and literally grab him by the shoulders and say, right, we need to do this, we need to do this. And I think he ended up scoring, scoring the winner from a, from a corner. Um, but that, that, you know, surely for a captain, that sort of thing should come naturally. That shouldn't take a manager to be, to be beckoning you over to the side of the pitch and doing that. Um, and it's something that we've, even going back to last season, um, Gary O'Neill was probably the, the closest kind of player we had to, to someone, you know, picking the other players up and saying, right, we need to get this game by the scruff of the neck. And, and even then, he had kind of weird moments like the, the, the sending off, which was one of the most bizarre sending offs most of us have ever seen, I think, with the ball off the yes. pitch. But it's something that we're definitely lacking. And I think the, the new man in, that's something that he's got to address straight away. Well, can, I yeah. just, can I just ask, Darren, as a player, do you think the leaders are there now compared to your day? I, I mean, you, you look around and... Um, maybe a, a, I look at a Vincent Company or a John Terry, but in your day, there was probably every team had two or three. I mean, do you think that's, I don't know, a cultural thing that's changed? Uh, at Norwich now, certainly not. I don't think there is um, those leaders. There's something that's... But the game has changed. It really has. There's, there is a, almost a swagger about with players now where they kind of... Um, they feel like almost like they're owed something. You can't touch them. They feel a bit untouchable. Where Because it is, it's just the game, the way it's moved on. And, you know, if they have poor game. You know, I use Brady as a prime example of that. I thought Brady was going to come in and tear the championship up. I thought he should be. He should be dominating every single week. And he didn't. Now, he's still got a 13, what was it, 11, 13 million pound move by playing poorly, essentially on his summer form he had for Ireland. So, you don't have to do a great deal to get moves now. And I think that there's no, there's no real hunger and drive. So, some of those players that could have it, don't have it. And some of the players who would never have it have never had it. But we haven't got any at Norwich at the moment. They're still out there. There is still players like that. But you'll find they're playing in the lower leagues. Because the, the, the foreign coaches have come in, they've brought a lot of different type of mentality players into football clubs. High wages um, probably take the players off the ball a little bit in terms of their determination to play for that shirt or for that football club. And I can't have a go at that. I think it's quite natural. I think people get comfy. Um, uh, it's something you can't teach. And I said, if you're in a position where somebody's going to say to you, you're going to get all this money... Um, it's really difficult. It's really difficult to change that mentality. But there are still players out there. But that's where the recruitment, again, comes in. You know, I know that Norwich would recruit a lot on stats. They'd look at the amount of distance somebody ran in a game or the pass completion or percentage of keeping the ball. You know, you can't get that. You can't, you can't, you can't scout someone's mentality by stats. You've got to go out there and watch them play. And I don't think there was enough of that going on. There was enough bums on seats in football grounds actually watching these players and seeing what they're doing find out what type of player they are how they spend their life when they're not playing a game what they do when they're off the pitch none of that was happening they were buying players on stats and, and, and things like that and that was a, for me was a massive downfall in Norwich's recruitment I thought they all just played FIFA yeah. they all played FIFA yeah. I'm getting off my chair um, you guys have a think about uh, your worst and favourite moment of the season I'll come and ask you and then you guys can go for worst or favourite moment of the season Darren a bit of time. Bit of time. Bit of time. Melissa, time. you don't get any time. Um, <laughs> you can have some time if you want. <laughs> no, the, I think the worst moment was the equaliser at St James's Park. Uh, it was a ball from a goal kick. Yeah, goal kick went straight over, sailed over Seb Basong's head. I think it's now on an advert, actually. It is. For a betting yep. company. It was that <laughs> good. He clears it once, though, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just, I think then that kind of proved to me this. This is going to be this is going to be the floor. This is going to be where we're going to fall down. You know, we, we've had this game. We, we're winning in the 92nd minute, and we'd lost by the 96th. I mean, that sums up the season, I think. Interesting, the equaliser and not the winner. I suppose it's, you know, it's a difficult choice, wasn't it? Really, gone bad. I was just going to actually <laughs> take, <laughs> Sorry, take, take the winner because only because oh, Michael, as you well know, basically the press box at St James's Park is literally behind the dugouts. And you're surrounded by fans, and it was literally when that winner went in, it was like the charge of the light brigade, all these Geordies down the gangway, 
banging on top of the perspex of the Norwich dugout. And Alex and I was just looking at him as if, yeah, OK, what do you want me to do? You know, I feel bad enough anyway. It was literally like, it was like a riot. And, and, and as Melissa said, yeah, now looking at back at hindsight, because you can just imagine if Norwich had hung on there that day, could have been also different. Well, and, and the way Newcastle season turned around after. Go that. on for you now, Michael. Go on. It's rolled into one, good and bad. I'm going to go back to what Paddy <laughs> He's started. clever. He's clever. Start this bang the first game of the season at Blackburn. That is almost brilliant because we knew the potential we thought we had, but almost we'd have been better off losing that game to know what the championship was all about. Um, and I think that would have taught us a lesson pretty quickly. Um, we cut, so after that game, we still went on a decent run of winning games, but we were just felt to me as if we're just getting through games, just winning games somehow without really tearing people apart again. So that in itself could have done a bit of damage. If we'd have drawn that game or lost that game, first game of the season, all of a sudden the mentality changes. This is going to be a fight. Perhaps something that, that uh, might have done us a little bit better in the long term. Imagine if it had have just gone the way it went anyway and they still didn't beat Blackburn. God, I mean, that would be like no, no wins. Go on, Neville. Favourite, worst moment of the season? Uh, Favourite was uh, the uh, Houlihan and um, Johnny House and goals against Forrest. Which one was the best Which one? Was the best one? House, House and all, all, all week long. And the worst was uh, Burton away because that was the last away game I went to. I threw, oh. the, I threw the toys out of the pram and said I'm not going away game again because if they can't be bothered, neither can I. So. Hang on, hang on, hang on. All right. So what, 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 what Burton away, what, well, what happens next season? Oh, uh, no, well, we start again, don't we? We start again. <laughs> Priceless. Come on, right. Favourite West moment? Who have we got here? Yes, sir. Yeah, I think Newcastle away. I think I joined the list on that one. I think you pointed out we went 3-3. We had about eight defenders on the pitch. 3-3, 96 minute, and we rushed in the net. Did we not pick the yeah, ball up? Did. Ran back yeah. the centre circle, 22 seconds, gave the ball away and managed to lose it. I thought that was incredible by Norwich's standards <laughs> to throw that away <laughs> in 22 yeah. seconds. I mean, Sunday morning, I wouldn't let my players do that. And to actually do that at this level, I think the two games against Newcastle in the Prem, when we lost 6-2, I think that was the beginning of the end. And this season, when we lost there again, I think that was the beginning of the end again. Yeah. Well, actually, looking right back to that Newcastle in the Premier League was... For me, I felt a real turning point in Alex Neal. For me, that was when yeah. things kind of started to go wrong. Um, but again, I think behind the scenes at the football club, a lot of trust was put in Alex Neal, and actually probably a little bit unfairly because he didn't have the experience to know what to do in the Premier League particularly, but also he'd never never managed in the Championship. So I was, like Paddy, I was surprised to hear when the kind of lack of influence that Alan Irvin did have um, and, and it was quite evident quite quickly, I think, because the defensive frailties didn't seem to improve. So you're thinking, well, what has he, what has he brought here? Um, and i have been up to Colney a few times, never has really seen Alan Irvin do too much. Um, so it was a surprise to me. Um, so, yeah, from right, from right back to that day, I think, you could see the demise was on its way. But we also badly wanted Alex Neal to do well because of the, the way he, he was successful when he first came here. But I still believe from that period when he came in right at the very start, um, and got us promoted, I did feel that any manager worth his salts in the Championship would have got Norwich promoted that season. They had a quality squad, um, just needed a bit of a change and a redirection, which in hindsight, again, is the similar thing to what we should have done with Alex Neal beforehand, because we knew with, um, with Neil Adams it was going wrong, change things around, turn things right. I think with, there's a little bit too much faith put in Alex Neal, um, but it, it is hindsight, but the, the signs were there for me right, right from the very start with Alex Neal, I think. Um, Sophie, Diane, <laughs> I'll just pick on you. Ellie, Ellie's got a microphone. Oh. Favourite, worst moment of the season? Worst moment. I wasn't at Newcastle because I was there the previous season and <laughs> Once it was, was enough. better to go again. Um, I think it was after the Brighton game. I was stood in the park and ride queue and all the Brighton fans were saying, just think we'd have been happy with a draw. <laughs> <laughs> it could be worse. You see the, the scars that Brighton had at the Norwich <laughs> Champions yeah. written on it. That was funny, wasn't it? <laughs> I think they'll get over it, sadly, but there we go. Uh, who, who else have we got? Yes, you, sir. Favourite? Worst moment of the season? Brighton away for the worst. Yeah. Um, be, being in the queue for the train and Brighton fans weren't even taking the mickey out of us. <laughs> you just felt... <laughs> and then to lose 5-0 to Chris Hewen as well, that just, that just rubbed it in. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Lucky Chris, eh? What have we got there, Jake? Sorry. Diane? Oh, go on, Diane, yes. Um, the best bit, Wes's go. Um, Harrison's goal and Wes getting player of the season. Good point. Who voted for Wes as player of the season? <laughs> Diane, you voted twice. That's not fair. <laughs> who, who else? Who, who, who didn't vote for Wes? Who did you vote for? I'd be, I'd be really interested to know. Jacob Murphy. Jacob Murphy. Anyone else nodding at that? Don't Darrell. Johnny Housen. 
Anthony House and two times player of the season. Could have been, could have been. Got, hang on, oh, I'm not very quick. Jake's much quicker than I am. Anita. Cameron Jerome. Yeah, yeah now, I, anyone surprised he wasn't in the, in the, in the top, top three? Go, go, go. Yeah, I was very surprised. Uh, 14 goals, was it? 14, 15 goals in a season? 16. 16, beg your pardon. Um, 16 goals in a season and not even in the top three, given the lack of support he got. Not sure, not sure mate. I'll take your word for it. Cameron Jerome. Yeah, I'll vote for Cameron Jerome, yeah. Wow, well, maybe someone lost all the votes. I don't know. <laughs> Melissa, did you ever vote? Uh, my vote was Johnny Housen, actually. Johnny Housen. Yeah, I thought he was in a poor season. He was one of our most consistent players, like he was the Premier League season as well. Uh, so put your hand up again if you voted for Wes Houlihan. And keep your hand up if you felt he was the best player this season. OK, that's more than I'd have thought. <laughs> that's fine. Hey, I love the fact that Wes Houlihan got player of the season. <laughs> that's it, isn't it? How are we doing for time, Ken? And he's wandering around. Are we... Half time? Half time. Okay, well, that is it. We have looked back. Ah, oh, we can draw a line under it now. It's not great. I'm going to go and sit down again. Hope everyone's all right on the, uh, on the Facebook. Facebook questions. Thanks, Kin, and he's doing a great job. Jake, Facebook questions. Um, I haven't got a question. It was just a, a shout out to Robson down here. I think one of your friends is watching. He said, There's only one Robson Summers. Oh. <laughs> uh, but yeah, there's. there's are, are we doing now? Are we doing the future? Well, what I would say for it? I mean, Robson sent me a message during the day saying, What, shall I, shall I dress in a suit or shall I come casual? Uh, casual, I guess you probably went for you. And that's what you went for. You had to pick him up, right. I can, a word for Ryan's glasses. Can you put those glasses on for us, Ryan, please? I think we need to uh, make sure everyone can see them. For the camera, Mark, let's look at those, look at those glasses. <laughs> Amazing stuff. Right, anyway. Are we doing the future? Are we going straight into Let's it? do the future. Shall we start with the, the seven players that have left? Why not? Shall we do that? Um, Robson, I've got a question from you here about Mr. John Ruddy. Do you want to ask it to the guys? Um, just asking, uh, how do you feel that he's um, been um, told to leave? Um, is that something you think is good or bad? Um, we had a chat about this last night on the Pinkin show, and I think yeah. everybody kind of agreed in the end that it, it probably was the right time for him to leave. Um, I think financially there's no way the club would offer him anything derogatory, and he, he said a lot about that in his post-match interview about how he felt the club treated him well, uh, they didn't try and offer him something that he was going to turn down. Um, but we, we can't say that John Ruddy has had a fantastic season, this one or last. I think he's... In goalkeepers, we've we struggled a little bit, but one thing in John Ruddy's defence is he's been let down hugely by the the defensive line, well, the defensive ten people in front of him. Um, he's a he's a he's a really good goalkeeper, and he will go to another club that will snap him up, and he'll he'll continue his career. But I I, I did just feel it was the right time for everybody, and 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 brilliant that he got the send off he did. We talked about this last night as well. It's very rare that a player gets that opportunity because normally when you get Dar sold, Darren didn't. normally yeah. <laughs> To bring it up again. It was sore last night and it's still sore. But it's true, you know, it's very rare. I mean, Hux has had a similar sort of thing. When you kind of told you're leaving the football club, you very rarely get an opportunity to go out there and play a game and say thanks to the fans for, for all the years you've had. So um, he had the benefit of that. But I, I just think it was the right time. I, I think he's, you know, talk about a fresh season. I think if, if he comes in again and makes a mistake early on the season, you then start to get blamed again. I think he's a great goalkeeper and, and has been a fantastic servant to the football club. And, and, uh, Handled himself really well on and off the pitch. I know he had a bit of a Barney with the fans at one point, didn't he, behind the goal? But I like to see that. Again, you talk about leaders. I don't mind somebody doing that. Um, but he's a, he's a great lad as well. And uh, no, I think we all wish him the best for the future. But I do think it was the right time to, to move on. And, and I guess the key debate that, that probably comes from it is the fact that most people think John is the best goalkeeper at the club or was currently and, and what happens next. Is there anybody who doesn't think John Ruddy's the best keeper? No. Nope. Well, I, I actually saying that. I mean, I think Declan Rubb is very unlucky in the Premier League. I, I felt he, again, was, as a young lad coming into a team, you need a solid defence in front of you to help you. And he didn't have that. Um, a lot of the goals I, I felt he conceded weren't his fault. He had a couple where I think he was uh, to blame, maybe. Um, and actually, in the Championship, I think he'll thrive. Um, he'll learn from the experience of the Premier League. He'll learn from being out on loan like the Murphy boys have. Um, and I think he'll come straight into the side next year and actually be one of those products that we have got from the youth team that have come through that, that will put a bit of value on his head, like the Murphy boys have done, which has been very rare in the last, well, non-existent in the last 20 years. So. Exactly, and given they're supposedly a category once, you know, with all the, I mean, it's, I think it's two million, I think is the figure annually that they're pumping in, which is a huge figure. Uh, well, and you want to produce players if yeah. you're going to put that in. Well, I had a chat with Steve Stone about this at one of Diane's events uh, earlier on the season, and uh, we talked about it quite a lot, and I, because I sort of wanted to speak to him about the, the fact that 
on a purely financial basis from the football club. They hadn't produced anybody in 20 years, yet it was costing them at least 2 million quid a year to run that academy. So they spent like 45 million over the 20 years and not produced anyone that was going on to be sold for money. So purely financially for the football club, that's not good. Um, so that's an interesting debate, isn't it? Is it that they're not producing anyone or that it's just the connect between getting players into the first team? Because there are players, a lot, we came across yeah. a lot of former well, Norwich Academy products yeah. who were playing in the championship yeah. for other teams. But I think, I think there was a, there's been a gap between the, the, the youth team and, and then the under-23s is a waste of time. We're not going to get onto that. Um, and then getting into the first team. So they have to go, if there any dec anybody's decent, if you're in the Norwich under-23s, unless you're a really youngster, you're not gonna, ever going to play in the first team, I'm sorry to tell you, but you need to get yourself out on loan. And the ones that are decent are going out on loan to get that experience and then come back. So, um, yeah, I just, is, they have got the talent now. I've seen it. I work at Langley School now, and I see the, the elite lads they've got there. And there's, some, there's some really good talent coming through, but it is giving them that opportunity. It takes a little bit of luck along the way. I'm, my, my, my debut is a little bit of luck because Dave Phillips was in contract wrangles with the club and said, I'm not going to play in a game. So they chucked me in, and, and your career kind of takes off. So... They'll need that, but also, again, Alex Neal, for me, didn't do it enough. He, was, he did it at Hamilton, perhaps because he had to, um, but when you're buying players like Naismith and people like that, you, you expect he's going to play them, which on occasions he didn't, but you get seven subs now. You should always have a couple of youngsters on the bench, or at least one, that when you are in those games, when they have been this season at home, and they're cruising three or four nil up, chuck them on. And actually, Alan Irvin did that, you know, and that, that's something for me that he has did. been a, a big miss is not get that little bit of progression for those younger lads and, and a little bit of trust in them. Well, yeah, you spot on. And, and, and he said, because um, I asked him actually after QPR on Sunday, w w why didn't Jake, Jacob come on? And he basically said that he wanted to get Madison and Godfrey on. And OK, it was only you know a few hand handful of minutes again. But as you would know, it's, it's, it's all part of that exposure and getting comfortable around your surroundings. Because obviously next season and the season ahead, because of the finances, the way they are, we could, you're going to rely on a Madison or a Godfrey to come through and and try and make the impact that, say, Jacob has done for the majority of the season. And Josh, I thought Josh was just starting to show at the end of the season that maybe he'd grasped it as well, um, which, to me, underlines what the hell they were doing going by Yannick Wiltshire in, the, in, in January. The thing is, they're not youngsters anymore, are they? Are they 22 now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah 20, 21, 22, yeah, yeah. They, they, they should be, in my opinion, they should be doing what they're doing now, probably two years ago in the Norwich side, maybe two or three years ago even. I think, just to jump in on that point as well, I think we kind of kind of almost protect the Murphys too much by calling them youngsters. Um, I mean, they are 22. That's the same age Nathan Redmond was when he was at the club. You know, no one was, no one was calling him a youngster. But we were, he even got criticised for not, not perhaps playing as well as he should have done. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, really, for the Murphys, now they've had this season, next season is going to be the real teller, really, as, as to whether they, they are going to you know, establish themselves and make the grade. Um, for me, they do leave the, the fullbacks exposed a bit too much, I think, defensively, um, which, which hasn't helped with, with how many goals we've conceded. Um, but the fullbacks are normally beyond them, anyway. Yeah, so. <laughs> true, yeah. That's, I think width, width anyway, is, is, is a bit of a problem in the team. We don't have a lot of natural width. We, we've just got an abundance of midfielders who like to play the central role. Um, so quite what the new man will, will make of that and what formation will play is, uh, is another question altogether. I get chopped out, I wonder. Um, Jake, have you got some Yes, um, in a second we're going to go to Diane. She's got a question um, about kind of moving forward after the seven players released. But before that, um, just a very quick one, almost playing a football manager. Bruce Kelf on Facebook Live has said, defensively, who do you want to sign? Um, he's mentioned the names of Grant Hanley and Stephen Colker. So just kind of a, a quick one there, if, you, if you've got a name you want to throw out there, and then we'll go to Diane. Can I just dive in? I think we, we said, didn't we, those two lads at Leeds, Bartley and uh, Janssen, they're not maybe a team closer in terms of on the ball, but they, it's thou shalt not pass attitude. And, um, and, and obviously they carry a threat in the opposition box, as we saw. I think it was for the second goal, it was Janssen near post flick, and it was Bartley reacting... Uh, quicker than any other Norwich player inside that box. So you, you're going to need, for me, this, this summer, proven championship performers in those positions. And I think those two would, would fit the bill, yeah. I've, I've only got the word Steve Morrison, and I don't mean Steve Morrison. At uh, uh, Cardiff, uh, the captain, Cardiff. Uh, uh, Sean Morrison. Sean Morrison is who I mean, because I think he's looked good personally. But there we go. Uh, for me, I don't care who they are, what names they are, just defenders look and defend. Uh, and I mean, in, in a sense, look. And I mean that in You'd a be great at recruitment, Darren, eh? <laughs> but I mean that in a, in a... Because we have so many forward-thinking midfielders and attackers in the way we play the game, and we, we kind of had that defensive midfield area, which for me, again, has never really worked particularly well with Teti. 
Um, we need defenders that can defend. You know, defenders that are going to be brought in to, to know their job and defend first. Because as I said, we've got enough attacking talent in the side to score goals. You know, we, that's where, as Melissa said, we get hugely exposed when we do go forward and lose the ball because they're all bombing forward, which is great when you're winning games and three or four nil up. You can, you can do it all day long, but when you're against a fight, you need a back four that we're actually going to stand, stay tough, stay back, and actually stay. How many times have we got caught out when the ball was in our own box and it, it, we then got forward? Our full backs bombed forward, and we left so isolated at the back with two, one or two defenders. Go on, Tim. That's yeah, all and, it, and that's what happens. And, and, and to be fair to Tim, that's not all his fault. You know, he's got to have the support around him to be able to cope with it. I mean, I mean again, when Mitchell Dykes came in, he, it was a lot of what he was saying. Well, I like to get forward. All that. Well, yeah, all right. <laughs> if you could defend, that would be grand. Just out of interest, hands up. Who would keep Mitchell Dykes for next season? Everyone Ooh. at any cost. No, obviously. Stupid question. Um, but th th there we go. Uh, do you want to go to Diane? It's Diane. Diane, you've got the microphone and everything. Away you go. Hello. Um, just looking ahead now, we've released seven players, which was probably the easy bit because they were all out of contract. I just wondered, out of the players which are left, which ones do the panel think might leave? This is where Stuart Webber will get creative, I presume. It's a word. So it's a, it's a great question because ultimately it's probably going to depend who comes in for them. Norwich may not even have control of that. Yeah, you've hit the nail on the head because ultimately what you're dealing with now is guys who are still under contract. So they're, they're not going to go anywhere. And we had this clearly with those seven. There was opportunities. I'm sure clubs came in, but clearly if we'll pick a name out, if Carl Laffett isn't going to get the money he was going to get here, he wasn't going anywhere. So it's slightly more tricky. I would, I would think he would try, despite you know assurances of the contrary, Nate Smith financially, you'd, you'd probably could feel you could move him on and recycle that sort of money. But again, who is going to come and offer him the money he's on at Norwich? Um, I'm not, not down on the bloke, but Wiltshire, I think, um, <laughs> if, if they could move him on, because cause I don't... Well, yeah, all right, maybe I am. But uh, I just don't think he's shown enough. And, and I'm, I'm not... Not judged. being disrespectful. So no, no, <laughs> wing, wing, wingers union here, mate. Yeah, no, but, but only because, you know, you've got the two Murphys, you've got... You know, if he still stays here, um, you know, the Pritchards and, and Wes, and, and the, there's basically guys in those positions. And I, I just feel you're not going to miss, you know, him. And, and the reality is they, they spent a lot of money on him, so I don't think they'd be able to recoup that. But I think that's, to pick up the creative point, is they're probably going to take have to take a loss on one or two of these if they want to move them on. And they're going to need to move players on now because otherwise they won't be able to bring in the players they want. Um, and I'll just throw another one in there. I think Alex Tete, I think he might be... In danger. I think he's only got a year off, to, off the top of my head left, um, and we've seen the last few days that they're getting linked with, you know, the boy at Stewart at Liverpool, that, that type of combative midfielder. Um, I think by his own admission, he, he didn't reach the levels he's reached before, and, and we all know physically he, he can't really handle the Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday. So I, I think that it might be a time for maybe if 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 all the planets aligned, that maybe Alex moved on. I think. I mean, we spoke to Stuart Webber at the start of the week and. Basically, the indication is anyone's for sale if someone offers enough money. So th there is that element. And that, I guess, begs the question, Melissa, who do you desperately keep hold of at all costs or as many costs as you can afford? I think, for me, the way Alex Pritchard has played under Alan Irvin has just, just proved... I mean, why he wasn't in the team under Alex Neal is, is kind of one of those mysteries of the season, really, up there with how McGovern stayed in the team when he made endless mistakes um, but it's, you know I think I, I wrote in a column we should build a team around him um, obviously given our defensive frailties that's that's got to be priority but the way he's kind of put himself about and, and impressed and he's so creative and I think we really have to make the most of you know there's a, there's a reason Norwich paid that much money for him and there's a reason why other clubs wanted him obviously including Brighton um, and I think we need to build a team around him and, and make sure that, that he's the guy we keep. And Houlihan as well, I know that they're, they're, they're quite similar, um, but I think the way they, they kind of linked up against QPR uh, just just shows that what he can learn off Houlihan is a kind of senior professional. Um, so I think we should definitely keep hold of him and and just, just see where we can go. Um, he's uh, he's going to be our main man, I think, for me next season. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Jake, another question from the audience. Mentioned Pritchard there, someone to, to build around in, in, in the future. Another man I suppose you can put under that category is James Madison. Um, so that brings me to you, sir. Sorry, madam. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, I just wondered if the panel thought that uh, Madison will be able to do the same for Norwich City as he did when he was up in Aberdeen. Um, 
he looks as though he could do. Yeah, I think if you talk about um, things that players have lacked this season within Origin squad in terms of desire and, and willingness to, to put their foot in, I think he's got a bit of that in him as well. He's a great player on the ball, um, but I think he's got a bit of heart and fight about him. Um, I've heard a few stories on and off the pitch about him, which, which isn't a problem. I think a lot of footballers are like that, you know, and... You kind of. I'll catch and it's not like enough to elaborate. It's not, yeah, we're it's not, me and Paddy's ears are pretty. Not, not in a bad way. I just think he's he's the type of lad that actually looks after himself, and and that for me is is a great sign from from some so young as him. Um, I think he'll go on and have a a great career at Norwich. I do, but and he's even you know he's been disappointed. He's not been involved. He's made that public that he's he's been disappointed. He hasn't been involved sooner, and the fact that he's a young lad and saying that and that brings me back to players like Craig Bellamy, who was just a that's a nightmare off the pitch. <laughs> Because he was the way he was, but that makes what made Didn't him such matter. good. But that's what, just, what made him such a good player on it. Um, so, I, I think he'll do well. I, I think it's just an interesting point talking about the whole, the way the club's going to go, and, it, and it's just so disappointing for me. You look back to what three years ago when they're in the Premier League, and I felt well, that's the ideal opportunity for Norwich to go and become a dare I say it, and similar sized clubs to Southampton, the Stoke, a West Brom. <coughs> that was the time they had that opportunity, and, and it's kind of fallen away. And now we're talking about all these players moving on for financial reasons, which is so quickly turned around. And again, for me, it was kind of a, a little bit of a, a sort of heads in the sand, I think, um, from above and, and, and thinking it was all going to be OK when actually that was the time I felt it could have gone on to that next level. Um, in terms of players staying, uh, it's going to be purely financial decisions. I, I agree with Melissa. The only one I'd really want to keep is Pritchard. Um, anybody else? Uh, Johnny Housen, maybe. But apart from that, actually, I'm not, not too fast. I think there's... Enough quality players out there that can, and, and uh, I'm really excited actually about the future. I think under Stuart Webber, they're certainly saying the right things, and, and looking forward to, to what happens in the summer. And I think we all probably feel the same way. I think um, Pritchard does have, seem to have a bit of a passion. You can see when he misses or whatever that he's annoyed at himself. Again, another one who, who off the pitch, you know, speaking to John Rogers last night, he did an interview with him up at Colney and said he was a nightmare because he wasn't playing and he just didn't want to do the interview. He was sulking. But that's because he wants to play. He's chewing at the bit. He's biting at the bit to get in that team and prove what he can do. And especially when you're brought in on big money, to not be given that opportunity to show what you can do on a regular basis. I think he got frustrated. And probably asking him, if you'd have asked him a few months ago, he probably wanted away. I wouldn't be surprised at all if he said, I want, I want away from the club as quick as I can to, to relight his career. But now Alan Irvin's given me opportunity in the side. I think he's probably actually looking next season thinking I could be the main man. Shall we pass that mic along the row and... You give us the player you would want to definitely keep hold of. Yeah, definitely, Alex Pritchard and uh, Madison. For me, I, I wish he'd had more of a chance. I think you, I saw him at Aberdeen a lot on television. He's on BT Sport and stuff, and I think he's a heck of a player. And I think if we're not careful, we'll lose him. We've just got an abundance of midfield players now. And I saw in the papers today we're linked with Tom Addy, Amy, the guy Stuart at Liverpool. Um, the guy like Barnsley, midfielder, midfielder, midfielder. You know, when are we going to sort the defence out? We, I think we've got an abundance of midfield players. I think we should keep most of them, maybe chip one of the Murphys out. But personally, Madison is key alongside Pritchard in the future. Uh, I'll let you into a secret. We're, for the weekend, we're doing a, a sort of an analysis of each part of Norwich's squad, defence, midfield and attack. I think Dave Freezer is doing strikers. He's got about two. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, is he, uh, he, you're doing defence, are you, Pat? Yeah, yeah, only because you took the midfield, Mike. Well, I don't know if I took the midfield, but you I mean, took the midfield. I've got like about 80 yeah. players to go through. It's ridiculous, but there we go. Anyway, yeah, let's move it along, shall we? Yeah, Pritchard and Madison. But the big change I want to see next year is the goals against Colum. You can talk as much as you like. If that goals against Colum is as big as it is next season now, we will not get promotion. And it's getting back right to the beginning. You, at the moment, you have the wrong players in your defence. And as your gentleman said right at the beginning, it needs to change. And it needs to change immediately. Fair point. Yeah, and Pritchard as well, but I'll throw a different name out there as well. Go Nelson Oliveira. Yeah, good shout. Still only 25. That's the thing that gets me. Yeah, Pritchard for me, easy, easy one to keep. Got to. Yeah, same for me, Pritchard and Oliveira. Good show. Right, don't sell those two then. <laughs> I think that the guys have been warmed. Uh, right, what else have we got here? Have we got any more? Well, Jake, have we got any more questions popping up? Oh, you haven't got a mic now. Well, I'll, we'll just pass it. Look at the efficiency there. Well so done, I'll sir. be interested to know as well. I've, I've spoken to quite a lot of the Norwich fans doing the, the, the Pink and Live show after Hello. the games on a Saturday and trying to gauge where they feel next season will go in terms of actually how long are they happy to be in the championship? Because I think Stuart Webber's kind of asked for a bit of time to... To, to, to turn things round, and that to me feels like a two or three season job that he's talking about, 
Well, so I think expectations are, for me, I think, and maybe for everybody else, is actually next season's the one because the parachute payments stop after that. Um, it's the, the one now. But the squad they've got as well, uh, next season is the one for me where actually I'm expecting them to, to be challenging as quickly as that. Uh, we've got a, a lanky new member in the front of the audience here. <laughs> is that me? Yeah, that is lanky, you. Lanky. You lanky. I did say lanky, yes. Um, I've got a question. Well, I've, got a question. I've got literally a word here from David Powell which says Shakespeare. I presume, are you after, are you after my Craig Shakespeare at Leicester? Well, this could be one in the, um, in the melting pot, couldn't it? He's, he's out of contract at the end of the yeah, season. Get, it doesn't look as if... Uh, no, not, not, not according to sources. <laughs> the day's got his own sources. <laughs> We're going to come on to the head coach uh, situation uh, right at the end of the show, I think, is the, is the plan. Uh, um, I guess, what else did I want to ask? I, the, you mentioned about the rebuild uh, plan and, and how difficult that is maybe to do it second season around, Pad. Uh, in terms of missing the boat, I guess, for the first season, is the championship going to be stronger? We're weaker next season. It's we kind of know most of what it's going to be now. I think the reality is, it's probably much of a muchness, isn't it? I, I, who before a ball had, kick, had been kicked would have thought Huddersfield would be up there. You know, there's always going to be one or two who come out of the pack. Reading, you didn't quite know how that would go as quickly as it's gone. I mean, you, obviously, most majority of us would have thought Newcastle would, would be up there. I thought Brighton would have a good season despite the disappointment of last season. Um, no, I, I wouldn't fear the three coming down. Well, we know two of them, don't we? Don't we? Oh. Hey! For those on the Facebook, we did predict that was going to happen at the start did, did of the show. Did we have a pound show. on that? Did we have a pound on that? Yeah, we should have done. At least it didn't hit you. Didn't that happen, was a, hasn't happen. injured anyone. Carry on. Uh, Nothing, uh, nothing's happened. <laughs> fine. Yeah, no, no, no. Oh. So, um, <laughs> I've lost my train of thought now. What were you talking about? Uh, the championship, the strength of it. Nothing yeah. to fear from the three teams coming down, maybe. Well, only because you look at Sunderland clinging on, clinging on, mainly at Norwich's expense too often, but that's a massive rebuild job. Middlesbrough, they, they seem to be neither here nor there, so it's gonna, I don't think that's going to get turned around instantly. And obviously we don't know Swansea or Huddersfield, uh, sorry, Swansea or Hull, but it, I wouldn't fear any of those three. It's more that I think Villa now, Steve Bruce, with another summer to do what he needs to do, he'll get backed, row it at Derby, they'll, they'll have money to throw at it. Um, you know, it's going to be those type of clubs. But the reality is, you know, I take Darren's point about Stuart Webber is pleading for a little bit of time, but I still think he would think it before a ball's kicked, start of next season, Norwich should be able to be in contention again. Um, because they weren't, as much as we, we, we're dissecting what we know is the major issue defensively, but ultimately when the dust has settled, they've finished eighth, they've been the top scorers in the division. Um, there, there's a lot of good players there. So, I mean, Alan Irvin said it to us again. It's not, in his words, it's not revolution, it's an evolution. If they can retain, as we've said, the Pritchards, the Oliveiras of this world, they will continue to carry a threat offensively. It's just really, can they do what they need to do in the window defensively um, to, to, to as, as the gentleman said there, bring the goals against Column down? If they do that, you would think they wouldn't be too far away again. I, I just think as well, Stuart Webber must have been licking his lips. When he sat at home watching his home games, how the way the team have performed... It is. It's a little bit of tinkering that needs to be done. I think you, should, you, you must be coming in thinking, oh, I've fallen on my feet here. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't tell us that, but yeah, <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me. I think we've got about five minutes to go. I had a, a question here that we got uh, emailed in from a, a Keith Hazelton uh, asking basically to bring up the subject of Alan Irvin staying on as possibly head coach. He would like to see it because of the improvement Norwich put in over his 10 games. But I mean, ultimately, I think it's, you know, he's not going to take the job unless it's offered to him. I think Stuart Webber has basically said it's not going to be offered to him. But it does bring up the debate, Melissa, should Alan Irvin still be at the club next season? I think, um, well, the obvious answer is the new man coming in, you know, will he want all of the coaches to be handpicked by himself? Um, but I think w what he has proven is he is a, he is a good coach. Um, you know, we, we kind of, we knew that already. Um, he worked under David Moyes at Everton and did very well there. I think his managerial credentials kind of very much contrasting. He went to West Brom, you know, he disappointed there. And uh, to be honest, I've never heard uh, an interim manager speak, not want the job as much. Wh when you hear him speak, you know, from, from the first kind of interview, yeah, well, I don't want it. Like, it's very, you know, mo most guys are kind of, all see what the club says and, you know, uh, stick my name in the hat and all the rest of it. From kind of day one, he's been very much, I'm just looking after it until someone else comes in. Um, w maybe that's because he, he kind of knows his strengths lie in, in the coaching side of it and, and not the man management of the team. Um, but I think, I think if he stays at the club, then perhaps that will help the new man coming in. He's going to know the players. We're, we're going to need some of that because although Weber's been here a few weeks now, obviously Irvine has been here since the start of the season. So he, 
out of everyone, he is going to know the players better than anybody. One subject I did want to uh, touch on was about the atmosphere at Carrow Road, because I know we've talked about it in a, in a show, and, and in terms of improving it. But I can't help thinking, actually, is that just a misnomer? Because if Norwich start playing well, the atmosphere will be fine. Is it that straightforward? Everyone's nodding and going, yes, yes. Neville says that would help. All right, then. So just get winning and we'll improve the atmosphere. Uh, which takes us on to the head coach. Who is it going to be? Um, we're going to ask you guys. We're going to get some names from you. I'm going to come off my, off my chair and everything. But you guys, who do you want the Norwich City's new head coach to be? If you were Stuart Webber, Darren? Um, I think he'll follow the same path he felt if he's followed at, at Huddersfield. Um, I just think it's, it's proven successful. And I think when you get in that position and it is successful, why would you change it? I can only see... Either Wagner come in here, possibly if they don't go in the, for the playoffs. Uh, I know Gary Monk has been linked, um, but I, I just think it needs a fresh face and, and someone from abroad. I think he'll go European. Um, someone who's been in a big European side as number two, perhaps like as Wagner was. Uh, I think that's the way it'll go because it's just it's worked. Why would you change it? Do it again, Melissa. Um, I think if Fulham uh, um, obviously don't go up in the playoffs, I think Slavisa Ikanovic could be could be a good shout. It's a great shout. I mean, he. Um, I think he's really harshly treated at Watford. I mean, he got them up. He's Fulham lost two of their, their two best players last season, and he's you know who would have thought that they'd they'd have done as well as they could. Um, perhaps they're they're not great at the back, which is a bit of a <laughs> bit of a worry after the last. The, hour the template's already here. It just it's yeah. slotting seamlessly. <laughs> Bad. Yeah, I think if Huddersfield don't get up, I think he'll go for Wagner mainly because. As Darren says, that relationship clearly has worked. Okay, Huddersfield, if they fall short in the playoffs, it's still an unbelievable season. Um, and what he wouldn't have to do there is, is because we've, we've, we've spoken about it, and Steve Stone said it again, the relationship between the head coach and the sporting director is absolutely pivotal. They both have to be on the same page of the same mindset, and those two guys clearly are. So you wouldn't have to try and build that relationship. And, um, and I, I would imagine, if we took a straw poll here, I'm sure if Wagner came in, that would be really exciting, wouldn't it, for most Norwich fans? It would be. Um, yeah, should we get some names? Sir, head coach? David Wagner. Wagner? David Ryan? He's taking your glasses off. Um, <laughs> I've, I've heard a lot of rumours mentioning play. Martin O'Neill saying he's got unfinished business at Norwich. Um, I'd like to see him come in because he's good defensively minded at, at the end of the day. We need someone who's going to sort the defence out and someone who's going to teach people how to tackle properly instead of wussing out. <laughs> Not even Pep Guardiola teaches people how to tackle properly. I haven't played under Martin O'Neill. I, I, I just think he might clash a little bit with people above him. Um, yeah. I think he's, he likes to be lead and do the way he wants to do it. Uh, and I think that as great a manager as he is. Sporting director, exactly. You know, and so that, that for me would, would knock that, that one on the head. That is going to influence the de decision. How about a name? Yeah, apart from Wagner, I think the dark horse was heckin' bottom at Barnsley. He was doing really well until he had to sell his best players. And if he would do the BBC job, then he could be interesting. And he, he did well after he sold the players, to be honest, the way the Barnsley season went. I'm sorry, Jake. Uh, Sir? Uh, should have got Harry Redknapp in, really. How about, Ro how about, how about Roy Keane? Roy Keane? No, he's, he's only joshing, he's only joshing. I'm only joking. I'm, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, probably bring someone in from abroad, I should imagine, but it uh, could be no one they've even talked about, so you never know, really. I, I do think it might be someone we've not heard of. Have we got a Michael? Do you want to pass the mic along the back? Give us the, uh, give us the names. Yeah, I'll go for w Wagner. Wagner. Daryl? I hope it'll be Yukanovic, but I think it'll be Rosler. Mm. Oh, Uwe Rosler. Anyone want Uwe Rosler in there? Oh. Hang on, hang on, Anita. Hang on, hang on, hang on. They're only talking to... Here you go. Well, I, I'd like Gary Monk, but they're talking about that Jens Keller, aren't they? Yeah, from from Union Berlin. Neville. Yeah, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd want Wagner, but if it wasn't, I'd uh, Jens Keller from Union Berlin. He's 46, he's a defender when he played. He played for Cologne. Uh, apparently he fits the bill. Hipster's choice, is that what you're telling me? <laughs> yeah, could be. Could, could be. The next hipster's choice, I love it. And uh, did we get along the back row? Did we miss one out? Sir? Yeah. Um, personally, I would go for Martin O'Neill. I take the point about clashing with those above. You want somebody who's going to fit the new system, but on the other hand, you don't want a doormat either. And certainly that wouldn't be Martin O'Neill. But I I'd be happy with somebody completely left field who we don't know about. Um, it's happened before and it's worked for us. Which would you be happy with? Because you've been saying yeah. that for a little while. Yeah, I, I just feel the, the way that the club's moving and the, and the shape it's taken and, and how they're putting the structure together, I just think a, a clean sweep, you know, almost... The problem is you bring in someone we all know about, there's opinions straight away whether they're the right person or not. I think someone fresh brings that, that new life to the club again and look quite exciting, is, is, as exactly as Wagner's done in Huddersfield. Spot on. Are we going to get some more names? Is yeah. that the idea? Go on, Jake. Pass it along again. 
Uh, Grant Holt. No, I mean, no, yeah, no, no don't joke. <laughs> Uh, I think it'll be someone left field. It always is, isn't it? No one would have said Lambert. No one would have said Alex Neal. So we'll just see what they come up with. Yes. Whoever the current Hamilton manager is. Yeah. Uh, Paul Canning, isn't it still? Is it, or has he been set? Is it Paul Canning? Martin, Something. Martin, 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 Martin Canning. Martin. Close enough. <laughs> Carry on. I've, I've got absolutely no idea as long as it's not Alan Pardew. I won't be. <laughs> will not be Alan Pardew, I think that's safe to say. Dan? I've got no idea either. No idea either. Any more suggestions? How about Mick McCarthy? How about Mick McCarthy? Who'd have Mick McCarthy? Hands up. Would you have Mick McCarthy as Norwich City's next manager? Jake would be. He's a Leicester fan. So I'm, I'm, only joking, Jake. I'm only joking, by the way. Gary, He's only joking. Gary Monk's my man. Gary Monk. Yeah. So do you, are you a little bit twitchy with the fact that there's this speculation that Leeds are going to offer him a new five-year deal? A little bit, because that means we'll get Rosler, who, in my opinion, has failed in the championship every yeah, time. Exactly. But. <coughs> a little bit of hostility towards Uwe. This is what I'm saying about opinions of people straight away with a... With pe- with we all know about, and you know, and names we all know about. That's that's why for me, I think, because it's worked for him before, he'll go that way. He might surprise me, but I, I just think he'll he'll bring in that fresh face that we're all kind of excited about, and start having to delve into their background to find out about them and uh, look look exciting future. I think there's too much history with too many names. I think it was even a mixed reaction slightly when Paul Lambert got the job. I remember that it took a few games before everyone bought into it. But there we go. You never please everyone all the time, or some people some of the time. I think we're up. Time's up. I'm getting lots of people doing that to me, so I think that's what that means. Um, Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, No doubt we'll be doing more of these live events over the summer and, of course, next season too. But uh, I'd just like to say thanks to our excellent panel of Darren, Melissa and Paddy, to our lovely uh, audience here at Archon Towers and all you guys out there in the World Wide Web. Uh, Until next time and uh, the next season, keep believing and on the ball city. Do you like that? You like that, yeah. Good night. Thanks very much.